the BC Conservative Party now has a footprint in BC on the federal level. Our next speaker, the Honorable John Rustad, is spearheading a movement that will allow us not to have to be in bed with the Liberal Party of Justin Trudeau here in BC. Please help me welcome our first keynote speaker, John Rustad. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, boy, it's been, a, it's been a great day. It's been a long day, I know, for everybody. Um, I have about an hour's worth of material. I've been told I've got to do it in about 20 minutes, so we'll see what we get through. But I, I just want to start by saying this. First of all, thank you, everybody, uh, for coming out here today. And, uh, and really, I, I want to thank the speakers, uh, both last night uh, and today. Um, you know, some great speakers, some great information that was spread out. It actually, it's really humbling to be on the same stage with so many of those speakers and the, and the words and the stories that they shared. It makes me think, you know, there is hope, right? There is. We can make a difference. We can actually change what's going on around us. Uh, and that's quite frankly, that's why I was so pleased when Jonathan invited me to come and speak because it gave me an opportunity to talk, uh, not so much just about a topic, but sort of a, I guess you could say a bit of a vision. What we could be in terms of reclaiming Canada, reclaiming it, you know, one province at a time. Because quite frankly, that's what we need to do if we want to be able to build this future that I think everybody wants, you know, freedom. That's not something that, you know, we should just say, it, just a phrase word, it isn't. It's something that we should be, it's something that who we are, and something that quite frankly, that we've forgotten most people in Canada and in British Columbia. And it's, that's a scary thought. When you look at the agendas, when you look at what's being driven, uh, really, um, I'm, I'm very worried for democracy. You know, one of the speakers yesterday said, you know, democracy is floundering. I couldn't agree more. But the solution is truth. It is the foundation of democracy. And I can tell you from my experience in politics that political parties want to work in the shadows. They don't want facts out there. They don't want truth out there. Because by operating in the shadows, it allows them to be able to spin, to be able to present a narrative. And that's, whether it's in opposition or whether it's in government, that's what political parties want to do because they want to be able to put their own spin on things so that you'll consider supporting them rather than just putting the facts out there and allowing people to be able to understand what's going on and be able to judge for themselves. And quite frankly, that's what we need. That's democracy. That is where we need to go. And that is where I want to take our province. As the Conservative Party of BC, we need to make sure people have facts. You know, when, I, when the protests, when the, when the trucker protests uh, were going on and the freedom rallies were going on, um, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was in Vancouver and uh, there was a, a rally that was going on and the trucks were parading down Burrard Street and people were trading, parading around. I thought, well, I'm going to go walk through this. And the party that I was part of at the time, which was the BC Liberal Party, said, don't go anywhere near it. We, we can't talk about it. We can't support it, you know, all it will do is cost us votes in the lower mainland. And I looked at him, I thought, that's nuts. And so I went out and I took a walk down and I met some of the people and uh, walked along. And it reminded me, quite frankly, of the 2010 Olympics. People were waving flags. They were proud of the country that they belonged to. They were singing O Canada at the top of their lungs. Good God, this to me is Canada. That, to me, is the real power of what we want to see in this province and this country. And I talked to some of the people that, uh, that left the parade afterwards, and uh, they're walking along, and they didn't know who I was, and I came up behind them and said hi, and, you know, started talking to them a little bit. And I asked them, I said, you know, what, what drew you down here? And they said, oh, this is just so great. I mean, it's just such a great environment being able to stand up, you know, for values, being able to stand up for the principles that they believed in. 
And I said, yeah, you know, I, you know, I really appreciate that. I, that's kind of who I am as, as an individual and as a politician. And I asked him, I said, have you ever been involved in anything political before? And they said, no, no, we've never been involved in it. And I asked them, did you vote in the last election? And they said, no. To me, this is an awakening for a lot of people. 45%, close to half the people in this province and in this country don't vote. That means we're allowing the special interest groups to take control of the agenda, to drive our policies as a province. Because just a small percentage can now have a huge outsized weight in terms of what will happen in politics. And we need to change that. And quite frankly, I think that is what, for me, when I saw those individuals, that's what to me gave me a lot of hope. Because I can tell you, when I was part of the BC Liberal Party, you know, I would go out and I would knock on doors and I would talk to people and they would say, you know, well, I'm, I'm not interested in politics. I, I said, do you vote? No, no, I don't vote. I mean, they're all the same. And I used to argue, no, no, they're not. Their policies is this and that. And they'd say, no, no, you, you guys are all the same. And it wasn't until after I got kicked out of the BC Liberal Party for standing up for my riding that I finally got it. They are all the same, you know? There is not hardly any difference between them. But you know what, it doesn't have to be that way. It really doesn't. We don't have to have the politics that we have today. We can change it. You know, some people have approached me and the, the, I was talking to the leader of the Green Party just when the House was wrapping up uh, a couple of weeks ago. And she said, well, what do you think now? Should we change, you know, do you support the idea of going to proportional representation and changing the way that we vote? And I said to her, I said, what difference will it make? And she said, well, we'll be able to have better balance and more people, you know, in the, in the legislature. And I said, that's not going to make a difference. The difference is in the people you elect. The difference is made in the people that stand up for values, that fight for the riding, that fight for people, that fight for the freedoms, and that are not just parrots to a party. That is how you change politics. And it doesn't matter what political system you have, that is the only way that you're gonna be able to drive the kind of change that I'm hoping to be able to see for us as British Columbia, and that can sweep right across this country. You know, when I think about Canada uh, and I think about the struggles that we have and, and the differences, you know, from coast to coast, right across this country, it's hard to imagine, like, how on earth could such diversity come together to form a country? And you look at, you know, when it was formed so long ago now, you know, it was a rail line that ultimately brought us together. Uh, that was the, that of course was the headline. There was lots of other things that were happening. But I actually believe, quite frankly, we're on the verge of falling apart as a country. I am a proud Canadian. I am proud of the country that I call home. I'm a proud British Columbian. I don't want to see this country fall apart. I think actually, quite frankly, we fight, we need to fight to renew Confederation. We actually need to drive it from the province across the country to say, if we're building this country today, what would it look like? What are the things and the values that we want to put together as a country that people will want to be part of and that we can once again be proud of? That is something that can be driven at a provincial level to renew our confederation. And you see, for me, I think about it, you know, we talk about these free trade agreements and, you know, and we're a small trading jurisdiction. We need to be able to have these trade agreements. But I think about that and I think, why is it easier for me to trade with the United States than it is to trade with other provinces. What is the sense of us as a country, of working together, of furthering our national interests? It's not there, and it needs to. We need to develop a free trade agreement across Canada so that we can actually bring the provinces together for our common good, so that we can actually work together as a country instead of being divided. And I can tell you, I am sick and tired of both the politics, both provincially and federally, the politics of division. 
It is time we put those divisions aside and start thinking about a common goal where we're putting people at the center of it instead of ideologies. And I can tell you that this is nowhere more profound than in our policies around climate and our, and our policies and our reactions to um, you know, what is called climate change. Climate is changing, okay? But I can tell you, how is it that a policy that is designed to drive people in poverty, to, into poverty is the answer to changing the weather? How is it that a policy that is going to lead to scarcity of food, that's going to lead to high, higher food prices, and that's going to contribute to world starvation, how is that good policy for the people in this country that deal with climate? It makes no sense whatsoever. So I want you to think about something. What would, I, what would you say if I were to say that, you know, we're going to have policies in place that are going to lead to 100 times more people dying from climate and climate-related catastrophes. What if I were to say that we're going to put in policies that are going to mean that we're going to move from less than 10% of the world that is struggling to, to meet their, their needs in terms of food to over 50% of the population facing not enough food and going hungry? I mean, would those are the policy, types of policies and approaches that you would support? Because 100 years ago, the average life expectancy was about 60 to 62 years. Half the population of the world was facing starvation, was not getting enough food on a day-to-day -day basis. People just struggled just to heat their home and to be able to put food on the table. And the number of people that were, died because of climate, because of freezing or hot or catastrophes, was a 99% reduction to what we have today. Yes, 100 times more is what it would have been back then, a century ago. And the reason why all of that change, all of that improvement, our quality of life, the huge advancements in medicine, the, the fact that we pay just a small fraction of our income just on food, that we are able to live in, in more challenging climates because we have heat. All of that has come because we've used fossil fuels. And there is no viable replacement at this stage. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be looking to do something more viable and, and having a, a realistic path towards it. But when we're saying that you know, we are going to stop using fossil fuels, 40% of the world's food supply comes from nitrogen-based fertilizer. Now, I think it's great to use organic and, and, and to do the best we can in terms of food and our food source, but we're talking about billions of people in the world starving to death because of a policy on climate change. I, for one, am not up for that. I'm sorry. My, I can't do that in good conscience. We should be doing everything we can to support not only our own people, but what we can do to contribute to a world so that people can have a quality of life that we would want for us and our children. We should not be supporting policies, quite frankly, that are going to cause starvation. We should not be supporting policies, quite frankly, that are gonna drive people into poverty. Half the people in British Columbia are struggling just to put food on the table. How is it that we have government and government policies and all the political parties, except for the Conservative Party, support the idea of making it even more difficult to survive? To me, that is not the sense of what we need to be building. We need to put people at the center of policies, whether it's our health care, whether it is crime that we see in the streets, whether it is economic development, whether it is climate policies. People need to be at the center of what we do and what we should be driving. And as a province, quite frankly, we need to stand up and say enough is enough. We actually need to get to a place where we're going to put policies that are going to be supporting people, that are going to be improving quality of life, that are going to treat the environment with care, but are going to put the priorities on making sure that our children and our grandchildren are going to have the kind of life and quality that we were able to have 
And that can be done, ladies and gentlemen. That can be done. You know, if we were to stop every emission that we have in this province, we're not even a rounding error in terms of world emissions. Nothing. There's absolutely nothing we can do. There's absolutely nothing we can do as a country. You know, I look at what's going on in Europe and they're stopping short haul flights. They are actually buying up farms and turning them into parks to reduce emissions. They're limiting the number of cattle that they can have on their farms. And just, just to, about a year or two ago now, the new plant was built in uh, Ontario, I think in the Ottawa area. And this plant produces 40,000 tons of bug protein for human and animal consumption. 40,000 tons of bug. And there's a second plant that's now in the process of being built. This is what they think is the solution. And I can tell you, stopping cows from farting and belching is not going to change the weather. But I tell you what it will do. It'll destroy our quality of life. Limiting our ability to move around in the name of climate change just makes us vulnerable to more government control. It takes away our freedoms. And so that's why when I saw the trucker convoy, and I thought about where we need to be and what they stood for and those values that they took across this country and the, the flag that was raised around the world my hat's off to, to those people, those people that took that initiative. Because those are values that we need to fight for. We should not be expecting our kids to eat bugs. We should not be expecting our kids to not be able to afford a reasonable quality of life. We should not be expecting people in the world to be starving simply because we're trying to meet some sort of ideology. I suspect I'm already over my time, but I want to talk on just one or two more quick points. Uh, and I know that I'm between you guys uh, and Brian speaking and then, and then dinner. So, um, and dinner probably being the most part, because believe me, I'm starting to feel a little hungry myself. Um, you know, as a province, we have lost sight of how to actually be prosperous. We actually almost seem to be embarrassed about it. I mean, we have a tremendous amount of resources. We have a tremendous amount of potential. We could be providing the quality of life in this province like none other. But we seem to be, you know, embarrassed and afraid to do it. And I think, quite frankly, that we should, we should just, like I say, say enough is enough and put a policy in place that is focused on people. And for economic development, there was a, you know, Germany faced a pretty serious situation this past winter. Because of the, the war in Ukraine and the tragedy that's going on, on there, um, they couldn't rely on natural gas from Russia. Now, why they were relying on natural gas from Russia in the first place is a completely different topic, and I won't go into that. Um, but their green policies left them incredibly vulnerable. Energy prices were spiking. They actually put out a pamphlet to, their, to the people in the country telling them how to cook without energy, how to make a food without electricity or, or gas, because they're worried they're gonna run short. They got to the place where they actually were so worried they suspended their environmental assessment process and in nine months, they proposed, built, and operated an LNG import facility. In nine months. It took us more than 10 years to get an LNG project up and running in British Columbia. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I, I fully respect the environment and you know, the rights of First Nations, but we can't wait a decade for a project like that to go ahead. If we want to be able to really help other countries, and there's a billion people in the world that do not have electricity today. China is building two coal-fired uh, electricity plants every week, every week. If we want to make a difference in terms of the world 
um, as well as providing a prosperous future, we got to find a way to actually be able to export the one thing that we have a tremendous amount of, and that is natural gas. And we can do that with LNG. It's got to be able to be done right, but what I'd like to see is a commitment from a province that says we're going to start a new LNG project every two years until we get four or five of these things up and running. Now I get there's some people that may not be happy about, about the idea of doing that, but I can, if we want four LNG projects and it takes 10 years to build one, do we really want it to be two generations and a third generation before they see the benefits? That doesn't make any sense to us. That doesn't make any sense to me. We have to change what we're doing. And I tell you, and now I'm way over my time, but when you think about the challenges we've got in healthcare, when we think about the challenges we've got with crime, with mental health, we need resources. We need money. We can't do it by taxing people to death. And we can't do it by putting people into poverty. We have to make the changes that are needed, and we need the money to be able to do it, to make the investments to have the quality of life that we want and solve some of these problems. And that means we're going to have to be aggressive when it comes to economic development. We're not going to have to set aside the environmental standards because we want to make sure these are done right. That's what we're noted for as a country. But we need to be able to do this on an accelerated basis. So ladies and gentlemen, I just want to close by saying one, one last thing, which is we have two by-elections that have come up. They've started today. They're up until the 24th of, uh, of June. And I, I'm asking for a call to action. You know, it's great for people to come and to celebrate and to be part of this. But if we want to bring change, we've got to do more than that. We've got to get on the ground. We've got to work the campaigns. We have to be able to connect with people. We've got to get them out to vote. We've got to have to give people hope that there can be a better way to do politics, that there can be a bright future. And that's the call to action for our by-elections as well as you know, 16 months from now when we get into a, a full provincial election. We're gonna run 93 candidates across the province. I want each of those candidates to be able to stand up and be strong and independent, fighting for their riding, but also working for a common good. And that common good is to do everything that we can to put people at the center of our policies so that we can say to our kids, we are doing everything we can to provide the best future we can for you as a province. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today and, and uh, thank you once again for coming out and being part of all of this today.